Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. I am um, deeply concerned that we are developing a pattern, or that I'm developing a pattern. Um, this is going to be the second Sunday in a row that I say, man, I just kind of want to hang out and keep singing. Um, but... Um, but we're also a church that believes deeply that the Bible is God's word. And it is important that we pause and reflect on that. Um, I, I want to repeat something that has already been noted a couple of times this morning, and that is uh, we are doing communion tonight in this room at 5 o'clock. We're going to do a communion service. There's going to be a lot of time for singing, time for uh, prayer, of course, taking communion together. And... Um, why are we doing that? I mean, we've never really, to my knowledge, ever done that before in the 15 years I've been in this church. Uh, actually, closer to 20 now. Um, I think sometimes we fly by communion so fast that we don't really pause to take in, why is this important? What's going on here? And so we want to take some time and, and do that and really focus on what, why is it that Jesus instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, communion. So I'm looking forward to that tonight. And then we will launch, as has been said, the 40 days of prayer uh, coming out of that. And uh, this is going to be a time where we're going to pray through six different psalms, a psalm a week. And the psalms are going to take us through uh, seasons of life that we all go through, seasons where life seems to be going great, going well, and are really experiencing the blessings of God, and then seasons where life seems just totally out of control and chaotic. You, you may be able to identify one of those seasons right now. Um, and, uh, and then seasons where God takes us out of that chaos and by his grace and mercy gives us new life. We're going to pray through psalms that take us through that journey. And I think it's going to be really exciting for us as a church and for us as individuals and families and so forth. Uh, last thing I want to do uh, before we actually launch in is we started this last week, and this is I think this is really important. We've, we've realized as leadership, one of the things that we've, we've lost because of COVID restrictions is we don't take an offering. And it's really Sometimes we, we misunderstand what is most important when we take an offering. It's not the financial support of this church and its ministries. That's very important. And we are grateful for that. And we are grateful that the Lord uses your offerings for that. But the most important reason is because you are making a countercultural declaration to your heart. You are telling your heart that your hope, your well-being, your future is not dependent on the money that you are giving up, but is dependent on the Lord that you are giving that money to. And that act of worship and that heart-transforming practice is more important than keeping lights on in a building. Does that make sense? Since we can't actually act out that practice, what we've decided to do is um, just take a few seconds each service and go before the Lord in prayer and just say out loud to him, you are the source of our well-being. Our hope is in you. So would you join me in prayer as we make that affirmation to the Lord and to remind one another and ourselves. Lord, we, we do come before you recognizing that we are dependent, that there is no blessing in our lives that has not first come from you. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we take the time to acknowledge that in our limited perspective, in our fallenness, our sinfulness, it is so easy for us to cling to the things of this world as being the source of our comfort and the source of our well-being. And Lord, usually at the top of that list is our money. And so, Lord, we pause for a second and we say to you and we say to ourselves that that way of thinking is a lie. 
that you are the source of our well-being. You are the one who protects us, and you are the one who has our future in your hands. And there is no better place for that to be. Lord, forgive us for the times that we lose sight of that, and we thank you that you do forgive us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this is not a trick question. Who here has ever experienced an exhausted young child? Yeah. Have you ever noticed that the stages of an exhausted young child match the stages of denial? I mean, think about it, right? Or the stages of grief, right? You start with denial. Right, which is that child in full speed doing circles in your living room. Um, denial quickly gives way to anger, where there's lots of tears and high volume. And then you move into bargaining. Daddy, just one more, five more minutes, exactly. Um, then there's depression. That usually takes the form of more tears and more volume, but the way that I see it a lot or have seen it a lot is that's the stage when the child keeps coming out of the bedroom for one more drink, one more whatever. And then there's acceptance, and acceptance is when they kind of just eventually crash and fall asleep. Five stages of a child's exhaustion. I would like to suggest to you that we never really grow out of that. And that a lot of us right now, and I would say that I over the last couple of weeks have been one of them, experience something very similar with spiritual exhaustion. It starts with denial. Hey, Todd, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Then it goes to anger. Todd, how are you doing? Stop questioning me. I'm fine. And if I'm not fine, it's your fault anyway. Bargaining. Todd, how are you doing? I'll be fine when I get my act together. Depression. My act is not coming together, no matter how hard I try. Unfortunately, a lot of times we stop right there and cycle back to denial, anger, bargaining, depression, just keep going. The final stage that I need to get to, and I think we're going to be challenged to get to this morning, is acceptance which is the I'm not fine. My act is not together, and it's never going to come together. And I feel distant from God. I feel cut off from God. I feel lonely. Those are the signs of spiritual exhaustion. I think it's something that every single one of us at some point has felt. I want to suggest that the root cause underneath it is a wrong understanding of the gospel. It is a wrong understanding of who God is and what he has done. And we are, in fact, living more by the gospel of self than the gospel of Jesus. We're in a series in Romans. We're continuing that series this morning, and I want to... Uh, remind us of, of where we have been in the book of Romans. Paul has just talked about the fact that not everyone who identifies themselves with Israel, with the people of God, is actually included in God's promise. And, and he has defended himself or defended God by saying there are reasons for that. There are, there are things that God is doing. To explain, but why 
is it that Israel rejected the gift that God has given them? Why is it that all of these people who had been a part of God's nation, the nation that was set aside, why is it that when the actual Messiah finally came, they rejected it? And Paul, in answering that question, is going to basically say it's because they put their faith in the wrong place. They put their faith in the gospel of self. And in today's passage, Romans 9, 30 through 10, 13, we're going to see Paul develop uh, two different ways of looking at that gospel of self. One is going to be the righteousness of works. The other is the righteousness of self. Really two different ways of looking at the same misguided approach to righteousness. And then in the last part of, the, of this passage, he is going to identify true righteousness, which is found in faith in Jesus Christ. But we're going to start with the righteousness of works, which is in Romans 9, verses 30 through 33. And so let me read that part of the passage. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not Pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumblings. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. See, the point here is that Israel was using the wrong means to gain righteousness. And, and as as the Jews would have heard this and read this that were a part of Paul's audience, this would have sounded absolutely absurd. Look at what Paul is saying here. They pursued the law. They worked hard at it. They wanted to be righteous, but they did not succeed. And yet these people, these Gentiles, who seem to not even care about it. Oops, missed where I wrote that. Wrote that um, who did not care about it actually found it. Now, here's what's fascinating. This word pursue in the Greek refers to the idea of running. So what Paul is picturing, what Paul is describing are, are these, these, these Jews who are running so hard to gain, to achieve, to earn righteousness, and they don't get it. And the picture would have sounded just as absurd to them as if Paul would have described in our context an Olympic race where the gun goes off and the sprinters fly out of the race towards the finish line. And when the race is over, the judges walk up into the stands and hand the medals to three different people who watch the race. It just sounds absurd. But that is exactly what Paul is describing here. And now Paul explains why this happens in verses 32 and 33. They ran hard, but they ran the wrong race. They were pursuing righteousness that was by works or based on works. See, the Jews in Paul's time, and if you grew up in the church, this is going to sound familiar to you. The Jews in Paul's time believed that the way to be in a right relationship with God was by following the Old Testament rules, right? So, so they would work hard at following all the rules about personal behavior. You think of things like, like the Ten Commandments. And they would work hard at following all the rules that made them a fit, that, that, that united them, connected them to the other people of God, to the people of Israel. So, so think of things like keeping the Sabbath and circumcision, and, and there were religious festivals and holidays that they would keep. And those were important for them as a nation. And the idea was they would do everything perfectly, and if they could do everything perfectly, then the result would be a right relationship with God. And if there were things that they didn't do perfectly, well, that's why you had the sacrificial system. And here is what Paul is getting at, is that that effort was constantly failing. You were constantly 
falling and not keeping the commandments, not following the requirements of, of, of the people of Israel. There are versions of that that we have today. The version in our broader culture says, work as hard as you can to be the best person that you can. And then, of course, God's going to accept you. And what Paul would say is, but you know, deep down, that you don't work as hard as you can to be the best that you can. And that what you do is you numb yourselves to that reality, or you blame other people. Now, the church has its own version of that. And it says, God accepts me based on how well I keep the rules. Our relationship with God becomes totally about rule keeping and checking boxes. And you will find a lot of churches today that will be far more concerned about how much money you give, where you go and where you don't go, who you hang out with, than they are about the question of do you actually love Jesus? And are you in a growing relationship with him? Running, there is an obstacle that they trip over, and this obstacle is Jesus, the stumbling stone, the rock of offense. How is that possible? Well, Jesus comes along and says that you can't work hard enough. You can't be good enough. It will never be enough, and that was offensive to the Jews, just like it's offensive to people in our culture today. And here's the other problem. If you think that being right with God is all about keeping the rules, why do you need Jesus? He doesn't fit anywhere in the process at all. You can just do it yourself. See, righteousness acceptance of me depends on my work at keeping God's rules and my work at fitting into God's people. There is no sense of God's work in my life. There's no sense of being in relationship with God. That's not even the point. Very often the point is, I want to be good enough to keep God on my good side so that he will leave me alone. Everything comes down to myself. And Paul is now going to look at the exact same issue from a slightly different perspective from that perspective of it being about self. And that's what he does in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, when he describes the righteousness of self. Let me kind of whet your appetite a little bit for what we're going to read in these verses by something that happened to me very recently, or something I came across very recently. Say, well-known Christian leader, um, if I said this person's name, then I would say 95% of you would know who I'm talking about. Very well respected, dedicated his life to uh, ministry, serving God. And in a difficult moment, what I heard this person say, I'm not going to use the exact words, but I'm going to tell you in a, what exactly he said. This person who is deeply passionate about the Lord. He described God as emotionally needy who will take someone or something you love to meet his own emotional needs. If I were to ask this person or to give this person a theology, questionnaire and ask questions like, does God need anything? This person would say, what a silly question. Of course not. That's absurd. Does God take from people 
just to satisfy himself with no regard for the people he's taking from me. It's like, of course not. That's absurd. Completely misunderstands the love of God. But when push came to shove, what came out of his mouth was, God is emotionally needy, and he will take from you to satisfy himself. This is a person passionate about the Lord, but who at a very fundamental level misunderstands who God is. That is what Paul is saying happened to the Jews in verses 1 through 4. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He's talking about the people of God. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, Paul describes the Jews in a startling way, starting in verse 2. He talks about them having a zeal for God. This word zeal means an intense, positive, emotional response to God or, or feeling towards God. But the problem is... Object, the direction of that positive feeling was not the true God. Think about this for a second. These would be the most spiritual people you have ever met in your lives. These are people whose entire lives were, were surrounded by, dictated by, governed by what they thought it meant to be in relationship with him. It affected how they ate. It affected where they went. It affected how they spent their time. It affected who their friends were. It affected what they believed about politics. It affected every aspect of their lives. And yet what Paul is saying is passionate as these people were. They really were ignorant. These people who memorized huge chunks of the Old Testament really got wrong who God was. And he goes on to drive that point home even, even more intensely in verse 3. They do not understand of, they do not comprehend God's righteousness. And in fact, what they do instead is they try to establish their own righteousness. And as a result, they do not submit to God. They don't know or understand what God is doing and what it means to be in right relationship with him because they fundamentally don't understand who he is. They are committed deeply to their own efforts. That's why this is a righteousness of self, to their own efforts to being righteous. And because of that, they do not see any need for Jesus, so they are not going to submit to Jesus. That's why he's a stumbling stone. Because if you think it's all up to you, then Jesus is just an obstacle. Let me describe this person today. This person, what he would look like today, would probably have grown up in the church. As a kid, would have been a part of all of the, the kids' activities, would have memorized lots of verses. He would get all the answers right in class. And they would discover that by getting the answers right and memorizing the verses, people were happy with him. And therefore, God must be too. And that continues. It intensifies even as they move into youth group. And, and they learn more rules to devotions. And they start talking about purity and worship. And, and those things are important. But, but they just keep putting it in the category of these are the rules to follow to make people happy and God happy. And what they discover is that there are a whole bunch of these rules that they are really good at keeping. And then they discover a whole new area about the time that they, they are moving through youth group. That there are other things that they can do that really get the applause of people. And therefore really get the applause of God. Things like door-to-door -door evangelism. Daily devotions. 
missions trips, service projects for people in need. And he discovered that there are some of these that, that he can do well, some of them not so well, but, but they are things that he or she can do. And then they hit college and the workforce. And he begins to identify which rules and practices he's really good at. And he can maintain the applause of people and the applause of God by doing them. And by that point, what gets solidified in his mind is that being righteous meant doing those things and hiding the areas where he was not measuring up. Does any of that sound familiar? Because the person I just described was me. That was my experience growing up in church. My uncle was a pastor. Good Southern Baptist church. It's a very good Southern Baptist church. Uh, And no one ever explicitly taught those things to me. But it is exactly what I internalized. What I internalized was that by doing these things, I gained the applause of people, and therefore I must be getting the applause of God. And by the way, I always have to be careful about this in my own life. That's how a lot of people wind up in ministry. Because they just go, they just keep pursuing what is it that gave them the applause of people, and they connected that with the applause of, of God. And they assumed that the ultimate of that is ministry. I just described my life and a lot of Christians that I know. You see, righteousness based on works or the righteousness of self, which I'm calling the gospel of self, is really seeking to establish righteousness on your own. And there are certain keys to making that work that you become really good at if you grew up in the church. You work incredibly hard to be good. There are lots of zeal about God things. And you have to make sure that the standard of righteousness are those things that you can accomplish on your own through your hard work. So in the gospel of self, the only reason you need Jesus is to get to heaven when you die. And you really are not sure what he actually has to do with the rest of your life between now and then. Because you have turned righteousness into behavior management. The problem with the gospel of self is that it excludes everything that God calls you to that you cannot accomplish on your own. The sins of your heart, of your tongue, of your mind, the deep-rooted sinful character flaws. These are always excluded from the gospel of self, and they're never recognized by the people around us because we hide them so well. A righteousness based on works, based on self, is always going to be very selective about what gets included. Because if it's not, we quickly find ourselves in deep grief over our sin. And we wonder if we'll ever, ever find victory. I'd like to suggest that one of the biggest problems in our country today is not them out there and what they do. They're just acting like non-Christians. One of the biggest problems in the world today is the church. And specifically, it's the fact that the church is not heartbroken over its sin. The church has so embraced the gospel of self that we no longer grieve over sin. We either ignore it or excuse it, and sometimes we parade it on Facebook. The right response is not to ignore it or excuse it. It's in verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. We have a lot of people in Christian culture who need to be saved. There are a lot of people in churches who think they have embraced the gospel of Jesus, but what they have embraced is the gospel of self. What Paul is going to do in the rest of this passage is lay out the gospel of Jesus. It's a righteousness 
that is based on faith. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. This is the first section of really three different ways we can divide this last part of the passage, this last paragraph of the passage. And in this first section, what Paul does is he describes the nature of, of righteousness based on faith. And he's contrasting a law or works-based righteousness, the gospel of self, with faith-based righteousness. And the point of verse 5 is that law-based righteousness makes everything depend on the commandments. All of them. All the time, without fail, 100% of the time. That's his point. So if you're going to go down the road of the gospel itself, then understand what the standard is. Complete obedience to all the commands 100% of the time. Now, verses 6 and 7 sound kind of weird to us, but what Paul is doing is he's bringing together some quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, and he uses these quotes to picture someone who thinks they have to work really hard to gain God's righteousness. And here's what they're picturing they have to do. They have to ascend into heaven to go get the Messiah, the Savior, and bring him down. They have to descend into into the abyss. It's a way of describing what happens to someone after death. And they actually have to, to raise Christ from the dead. And what Paul is saying is, that is crazy. God has already accomplished all of these things. You do not have to do this. The righteousness that is based on faith is a righteousness that affirms what God has done for us. And then verse 8 shows us the nature of of righteousness by faith is not in what we do, but it's in what we affirm. The word is near us. It's personal. The the, the word is is accessible to us. And it is for us as as individuals. It, 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 It comes to the very heart of who we are. And it is something that we proclaim by faith. What specifically we proclaim and what we affirm is given in verses 9 through 10. These verses are incredibly familiar to us if you grew up in the church. And therefore, it's extremely important that we slow down. Because our temptation is to blow right past these. So let's do this very carefully. First off, he starts with the conditional. If there's a condition that has to be met, what's the result if the condition is met? You will be saved. So what condition must be met? Start with the word confess. This word confess means to bear witness to something in a courtroom. It is to publicly side yourself with someone else. And to confess that Jesus is Lord is to publicly side with Jesus in such a way that he is the the follower. Second part of the condition is belief. Belief means to entrust oneself with confidence. And we at our very core, which is what it means by in your heart, that's not just about emotions, it's about the core of who you are are to commit ourselves to the truth that God has accomplished exactly what he would said he would accomplish through Jesus. Here's what these verses are not saying. They are not saying that if you say the words out loud, Jesus is Lord, you are going to heaven. I have heard that. That's not what they are saying. They are not saying if you say that Jesus raising from the dead seems intellectually possible to you. I guess I kind of believe that that you are going to heaven. Here's what they are saying. What they are talking about is what is going on inside of you at a core level. It's about the question of whose side are you on? What do you actually think is true about God and yourself and Jesus? Not what you say you believe, but what you actually believe. 
In verses 11 through 13, Paul takes some more Old Testament quotes, and, and he's making the point that the Old Testament has pointed out all along that the gospel is true. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's saying that all along, even in these Old Testament quotes, the gospel has always had a broad scope. It's always been meant to include Gentiles as well as Jews in God's people. Um, one of the questions that this passage should raise is a very practical question, especially to parents who are sitting there. If you're thinking to yourself, I kind of was brought up with the idea that you become a Christian when you say the sinner's prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. And I'm not hearing you say that. So how do I know, based on what you're saying, if my child is actually a Christian? What needs to happen? Well, first let me say, I don't have a problem with people using the sinner's prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, even though I will remind you that historically that was actually invented in America. Um, it does not exist. Before America, the concept of the sinner's prayer did not exist. Um, I want you to notice something, though, that even though it's okay, as I said, because it was invented in America, you will actually not find it anywhere in Scripture. You cannot go to a place in Scripture and say, here is the sinner's prayer. So what is Romans 10 saying identifies someone as a Christian? I think it comes down to this. Being a Christian means living in reality. And there are three parts of reality that you need to understand, that you need to be convinced are true. That's, that's the, the, the language of belief. Convinced are true. And they are about God and you and Jesus. Number one, God loves you and wants to be in relationship with you that will last forever. That needs to be, that needs to be something that is, that is deeply wired in you. You are designed to live in relationship with God. And you know, a small child knows that there are things in their lives that are not perfect and good God. And in fact, they keep that, that person out of relationship with God. And then third, God's love for you is so great that he sent Jesus, his own son, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross and be raised three days later. And Jesus loves you so much that he did that willingly. See, the point of Jesus' death on the cross was to take all the penalty for every wrong that we have ever done or ever will do. And the resurrection means that we have new life in relationship with God that starts now and lasts forever. And it is a life where more and more you become like Jesus. So if a parent comes to me and says, help me understand if my child is a Christian, here are the questions I'm going to ask. Is that child, or you, convinced that these things that we just said are true? That God loves you and wants to be in relationship with you? That there are things inside of you that need to be forgiven for God to be in that relationship with you? And that Jesus made that forgiveness possible through his perfect life, his death, and his resurrection? Right? That's the belief. And understand that the belief, word belief in the Greek does not mean, yeah, I guess I think so. It, it means that, that that's that you're really convinced of that? And are you convinced enough of Jesus' love for you that you want to know him better and become like him? That's the confession part. You're not going to be perfect. Start a journey that will last for the rest of your life. So I'd ask a, a parent, are, are those things true of your child? And here's the thing that's really fascinating. Those things might have been true of your child long before they ever said the sinner's prayer. That child may have been saved long before that ever happened. That child might be going through a period right now, especially if it's an adult child, where they don't act like any of it's true. 
And that, that doesn't mean they're not a Christian. Because I don't like to look at snapshots in someone's life. Give me the big picture. How is God at work in their lives and how they responded to it over a lifetime? A couple of principles that I want to just pull out of this passage. The gospel of self replaces Jesus with you. We've already talked about this, but it's important that we keep this at the forefront of our thinking. Let me show you how this works real quick in, in a couple of charts. The biblical view of God's law, the biblical view of, of how God's law fits into righteousness is this. God always starts by pursuing us. He, he is always the initiator. And he makes us his people. If you look throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it always starts, you are my people, therefore here are the guidelines. Here is the law because you are my people. Because we are his people, he gives us the guidelines, and then we walk in obedience to the law, to his rules. Not to achieve the status of God's people, but because we have the status of God's people. The gospel of self, especially when it plays out in the church, is legalism. We put the rules first, say work really hard at those rules, and if you do it well enough, then you have the status of God's people. And of course, the rules that we give them are usually the rules that we ourselves are good at keeping. Are tempted to function at times by the gospel of self because it puts everything under our control. So we must pay attention to which gospel we are believing at each moment. Is it the gospel of self or the gospel of Jesus? How do you know if it's the gospel of self? Four signs. You tend to live in fear of God's rejection. Failure, you work very hard to keep the rules, but you fail, and it's more than you can handle when you do. Fracture, you respond to your own failure by distancing or blaming, usually God or others. Sometimes a fracture takes the response of, look at that person's sin. I can't be around them anymore. Look at that person not living up to my standards. I can't be around them anymore. Quick aside. There's a large church here in town that has implemented a mask requirement rule. Um, I don't know if we have anyone here that this morning joining us in person or online that is mad that they have done that and are checking out other churches. I'm going to make a plea to you. Please do not allow that to be what causes you to break fellowship. That is not a biblical reason to break fellowship. And in fact, only shows that you're operating out of the gospel of self. After fracture comes fatigue. Trying to maintain perfection and the appearance of perfection is going to exhaust you. And then this cycle just repeats itself again and again. And I suspect that's why a lot of people right now are experiencing that. How do you break the cycle? Jesus laid it out. Throughout the gospel, Jesus says, the response to me is to repent, believe, and follow. And that response not only brings us into relationship with him, it is what, how we live out the relationship with him. We repent, we stop hiding and blaming others, and we acknowledge and accept our own sin. The gospel of self, when we're operating on that, we must acknowledge that we are living as if our well-being and the well-being of others is totally up to us. Or we must acknowledge that we have allowed someone not following our rules to break fellowship with us or we've broken fellowship with them simply because they acknowledge our rules. And we must say, this within me must stop. We believe that's the settled confidence in God's love and who Jesus is and what he has done. And, and we must accept that Jesus is enough and is the only one. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang it, but it is so hard to live it. 
we must accept with confidence that the grace of Jesus extends to everything that you need to repent from and everything that those around you need to repent of. We follow, we live out the intention of becoming more like Jesus. That's what the disciple is. We look at what does it mean to be Christ-like in this situation? If I've broken fellowship with someone, do I need to restore that fellowship? If I've identified in sin in my own life, where, where do I need to take steps to remove that sin? There's a lot of spiritual exhaustion out there right now. For some, you look at your life and say, my, your entire life has been lived trying to be good enough for the people around you, for yourself, for God. And every time something bad happens, you, you, you question what you did to deserve it, and you wonder if God is rejecting you. Or you find yourself deeply frustrated that you cannot be the good person you think you should be, and you wonder what God thinks about you. There are others who have believed in the gospel of Jesus, and yet you are, you're deeply confident that you can't earn a relationship with God, but you don't have to because Jesus' death and resurrection, and, and, and you have accepted that, but you are still spiritually exhausted. And if you look underneath, you will almost certainly discover that the gospel of self is at work, pressuring you to achieve what Jesus already achieved for you in some way. This passage is calling both groups to a decision right now. Where are you going to put your faith? Gospel of self, the gospel of Jesus. Is your heart pulling you to live into the realities of who God is, who you are, and what Jesus has done for you? Will you turn away from the gospel of self and it's a lie that you can be good enough for God? Will you set your confidence in Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection? And will you move forward becoming more like Jesus who loves you more than anyone else? The Lord is challenging you to put your faith in the good news of Jesus, not the gospel of self. And that is the point of today's passage. Don't misplace your faith. Root out legalism from your life. Why are you spiritually exhausted when Jesus promised to, to lighten the burden and give you an abundant life? It's because somewhere you are not living the gospel of Jesus. You are living the gospel of self. As we leave here, I want to suggest some ways that you can move toward freeing yourself from the gospel of self or joining the Holy Spirit's work in freeing you from the gospel of self. And becoming more just embraced by the gospel of Jesus. Again, I encourage you to rewrite the passage in your own words. That's an exercise that will help you drive the truths deeper in. Ask someone to share where they see the gospel of self at work in your life. That is a terrifying conversation. But this is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. Ask the Lord to convict you of your areas of legalism. And daily assess where fear failed has revealed the gospel of self. The Holy Spirit wants to do this work in your life. Let's join him in that. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you as fallen and broken people. We come before you as people who desperately cling to the gospel of self because... Frankly, in some ways, it seems easier. It seems like it's in our control. It feeds our pride to think that we can be good enough. Lord, we thank you that you do forgive us for that. Lord, we thank you that through Jesus, we can find freedom. We thank you for the good news of Jesus that says we don't have to be good enough because Jesus was. We don't have to try to tip the scale and be better than our bad deeds because Jesus was. And he's taken the penalty for all the things that we've done. And Lord, we don't have to 
scratch and claw to try to be better people because your Holy Spirit is at work in us to move us to be more like Christ. Lord, we say these things, we know they are true, but in daily life, we have a hard time living it out. And we ask for your help with that. And Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know you, who has, who has lived their whole lives under the gospel of self and have never known the freedom of forgiveness and new life that is in Christ, Lord, we ask that today your Holy Spirit would stir them. They would say, yes, I, I, I want that new life. And we ask that that would happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what we've said about God. God pursued you, and he still pursues you to replace your exhaustion with rest. So the charge for you is to leave here and replace the gospel of self with the gospel of Jesus in your daily thinking in life. We'll have folks who want to pray with you, especially if you want to get to know Jesus for the first time. I'm available to pray with you, and we should have some folks out at the table to my right in the lobby. And uh, please, come talk to us, come pray with us. If there's anything in your life you'd like to pray about, you are dismissed.